Welcome to the Luke 418 Radio Talk Show, the leading cutting edge of Christian radio. Today we have the Righteous Twins with us. They'll be speaking on heavenly instructions of 1 Peter. Folks, this is going to be a real exciting information that we can apply to us because the scripture says that we are no longer belong to this world we're not jews or gentiles we are a new person god made a new person out of the jews and gentiles we're new that's where god says old things have passed away all things have become new and you're to live your life unto god as a new creation from coast to coast and worldwide on the internet via satellite, this is Luke 418 Radio Network. You tuned into Luke 418 Radio Talk Show, the leading cutting edge of Christian radio. Exposing the works of darkness and declaring a life of righteousness. You guys rock! You guys rock. Welcome back, folks, to the Lou 418 Radio Talk Show, the leading cutting edge of Christian radio. Pastor Valerie and Minister Barbara Lee. Wow, there is an exciting conference coming up for women only. Why don't you share a little bit about that, Pastor Valerie? Amen. Praise God. You know, we're coming up very quickly. Just a few days away now, we'll be at the Renaissance Resort and Spa in Indian Wells, California for our 2018 Women's Conference, Luke 418 Church. It's going to be a fantastic time for women to come and get healing, inner healing, deliverance. Everything you need will be there for you. We have our guest speakers coming, um, remarkable women in the Lord. We have Colette Boudouin. We have Sherry Wakeman. And we have Myself and Barbara, Minister Barbara Lee is going to be there, and also Maria Burbe. So it's going to be an exciting time. I want to welcome all you women that are going to be there. Uh, it's I'm just so excited, aren't you, Barbara? Oh, yeah, I am. I'm looking forward to it. Praise God. Praise God. We have a video, uh, actually an audio clip on this. We're going to play it right now. Welcome to Luke 418 Church Women's Conference. This will be a wonderful time of breakthrough for women to come and get spiritually fed. Do you sometimes feel that you just can't control your thoughts? Do you feel hounded by bad memories of the past that still feel alive today? Are you hurting on the inside? If so, Luke 418 Church Women's Conference can help free you from the pursuit of that mental and spiritual anguish. Free yourself from the past and free yourself from the hurt you feel inside. If you are experiencing repeated feelings of anger, hatred, lack of self-control, anxiety, or confusion, come to Luke 418 Church Women's Conference who can restore you and set you on a road to recovery. The lineup of speakers along with Pastor Bill French who's hosting this event are Reverend Colette Boudouin of International Restoration Ministries, Sherry Wakeman of Luke 418 Church Radio, talk show host, Reverend Marie Burbet, who is a professional counselor, 
and I will be there, Reverend Valerie French, and my sister, Minister Barbara Lee. We are the Righteous Twins. Come for your healing breakthrough and become spiritually fed. The conference will be held on September 8th, a Saturday, 2018, from 10 a.m. to 9 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. And the location will be 444 Indian Wells Lane in Indian Wells, California. And that will be at the Renaissance Indian Wells Resort and Spa. Please come, bring your friends. This will be a wonderful time of restoration and healing for every woman who needs help. Amen. Praise God. Well, we have are going to be starting today on the uh, epistle of Peter. Uh, praise God. We're going to go verse by verse. We're going to learn a lot. Uh, Peter was a fantastic apostle, one of the inner circle of Jesus, uh, of the three, uh, Peter, James, and John. And uh, he wrote the book of First Peter. And that's in the New Testament. Now, there's a lot of amazing things in this, in this uh, epistle. And we are going to study, because there's, there's some last times and last days eschatology in this epistle. Which And eschatology is a word that means the study of the last days. And we want to start in chapter 1. So if you will turn to 1 Peter we can start our study. So we're going to be going verse by verse, and I'm going to have Barbara and myself go through it. We're going to read about three scriptures, and then we're going to discuss it. Now, Peter was uh, suffering terribly during this time. I'll give you a little history. There was a very uh, huge uh, uh, persecution of the Christians at this time. And it was in 64 AD that Peter wrote the epistle of Peter. And it was a time of great uh, persecution, like I said, of the Christians. And it was a time here in the beginning where it talks about in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 1, it says, To the pilgrims of the dispersion in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, and this is a, what it means by the dispersion. Now, there's different terminology. It's called the diaspora or the dispersion. And also uh, also could be said the pilgrims or the strangers. And in some versions, it says the aliens. So these are, these are the Jewish people that were taken out of Jerusalem at this time and they were dispersed all over the, the Mediterranean because of either they were Christians being persecuted or they were Jews being persecuted. And this was shortly before the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD. This is when Titus came in and, and the Romans and they destroyed Jerusalem and destroyed the temple. It was a horrible time. So it was very, very uh, hectic now. And Peter wrote this shortly before his uh, crucifixion in, by Nero in 64 AD. Elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father in sanctification of the Spirit for obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. So Peter the, is an apostle of Jesus Christ, and he's giving a letter to the people who had been dispersed because they were in very great fear of their lives, and they needed comfort and encouragement to keep the Christians together at this time. So he says, grace to you and peace be multiplied. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. So now Peter is introducing himself and introducing the gospel and trying to encourage the brethren of who we are in Christ Jesus through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, that we are begotten as sons and daughters of the Most High, and we have a living hope, who is Jesus Christ, who was crucified and yet rose again. So the religion, he's telling them, the re Christian religion isn't dead. It's 
very much alive and that we have an inheritance through the sanctification of the spirit and it's done by the sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ who died on a cruel cross at Calvary to become a propitiation or a sacrifice once and for all for our sins. And we must understand that once we are in this living hope and we are obeying Christ, we become part of that resurrection. Right, Barbara? That's absolutely right. And what a beautiful promise this is that we can grab a hold of in this day and in the last times, because we are certainly in the last times. We can feel it in the atmosphere everywhere. And even the uh, creation is groaning and, uh, and desiring for the uh, culmination of the return of Jesus Christ. Amen. Praise God. So we have a heavenly inheritance, and as we go on into verse 4, to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled, and that does not fade away, reserved in heaven for you, who are kept by the power of God through faith for salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. In this will you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while, if need be, you have been grieved by various trials. So praise God. Peter is speaking to the diaspora, and he's telling the Christians here that are very uh, frightened and of, of the things that are going on, uh, pers- great persecution, and they're under great stress. So he's telling them, blessed be God the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to his abundant mercy, has begotten us again to a living hope, to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled that does not fade away, reserved for you in heaven, who are kept by the power of God through faith and salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. So the whole scope of the plan of salvation is being laid out here by Peter, that the Christians have been inherited, incorruptible, have become grafted in, as John talks about in John chapter 15, he speaks of the the Christians being grafted in, to the vine, who is Jesus Christ, and we are becoming his adopted sons and daughters, and also uh, an inheritance being Jewish Christians, uh, becoming completed Jews, coming out of the uh, doctrines of the Old Testament, and not taking all of them out, but the ones that Christ had come to fulfill, because he did not come to take away the law, he came to fulfill the law, but he's showing them a better way. Because we have become into an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled that does not fade away. Heaven being reserved for you who are kept by the power of God through faith and salvation. Because that is done on a one time when he died on the cross for all man's sins. The Old Testament uh, sacrificial lambs was just a temporary covering of sins for the Jewish people until Christ came. And then when Christ came, he became the full sacrifice in heaven, uncorruptible, an inheritance for the Jewish people to be done once on the sacrifice of the crucifixion on the cross, became that one-time sacrifice of his blood being the power that brought all men unto salvation through the belief of Jesus Christ as the Son of God. And now Peter's saying, we greatly rejoice, though now for a little while, if need be, you have been grieved by various trials. They had many, many things they were going through at this time. They were very frightened of the Roman soldiers who would come and take them away to prison or behead them or take their women and and, and rape their their sons and daughters and take them and and they just walk into their homes and take whatever they wanted uh, it was it was just a horrible time. I think that the time Peter's speaking of here is very much time like the great tribulation will be. Uh, although this time was the time uh, during a Ner- Ner- when Nero was persecuting the Christians, and he was a brutal, brutal dictator of the Roman uh, king there in in Rome. He was a Caesar Nero. He was one of the most ruthless. Uh, uh, along with Caligula, who did the most horrible, heinous crimes. And he would actually have uh, Christians uh, put on crosses along a gateway where they would walk. And then he would light them up 
with torches and burn them alive as lights so the people could see at night the soldiers could walk through there it, it was just brutal and he was steeped in in pedophilia all kinds of bestiality horrible orgies and things they would do in their feast days and occultic rituals so it was a horrible horrific time and it was so a to the to the jewish people who saw these kinds of horrendous things that they were doing so peter is giving them comfort during this time saying they are grieved because of various trials because right now they're going through a great persecution and a great trial barbara do you have anything to say about this well what uh, stood out to me is that when it said an inheritance reserved in heaven for you and uh, I liked reading it that way and realizing that we do have an inheritance and it's reserved in heaven and no one can take that inheritance away from us if we have given our hearts and lives to Jesus Christ and, uh, you know, asked him to forgive us for our sins and asked him to be our Lord and Savior. We have that reserved in heaven for us, that these promises. And it says that it's incorruptible and undefiled and it cannot fade away. And so if we, we, you know, dwell on that and uh, meditate on that, that's just an incredible uh, comfort, an incredible uh, promise to hold on to, especially when in the last times we are going through uh, many various trials. And uh, I don't know very much. I don't really know very many people that aren't going through many various trials right now. It's it's a hard time. It's a difficult time. And uh, But God is telling us, as in Peter's time, as in now, because uh, time for God, is it, there, there is no time. Um, he can uh, have something that he has written in the scripture that is in history that was meant for a certain period in the past. It can also be the same message that is meant for the present, because I believe that the scripture is, is triune, just like God is triune, just like we are triune beings. The scripture is triune. It can have happened in the past and been as powerful then and as, as uh, pertinent a message then as it is in the present. And it's also a message for the future. It's just amazing that the scripture is so uh, powerful and the living word of God does is living word. It, it continues on and on and on and it becomes uh, just as uh, you know pertinent today as it was 2,000 years ago. So I'm excited about that. And we can read the scripture personally and take it into our lives as a personal word from our Father to comfort us in these difficult times. And uh, I will go on with seven, if you uh, would allow me to, that the genuineness of your faith being more, much more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to praise, honor, and glory at the re revelation of Jesus Christ. Whom have, having, uh, verse 8, whom having not seen, you love. Though now you do not see him, yet believing, you rejoice with joy inexpressible, inexpressible and full of glory. Verse 9, receiving the end of your faith, the salvation of your souls. It just, it's so beautiful. These scriptures are just packed full of hope. They're just packed full of promise. They're just packed full of um, the beautiful uh, promises that we have which is sure and reserved in us for heaven that does not perish and does not fade away so we can take hold of these and read them over and over and fill our hearts full of um, you know full of um, hope and glory because we are partakers of God's divine nature that the genuineness of your faith. Now, I've learned in scripture that when there's promises, there's conditions. One of the conditions here is that your faith is genuine. There's many people in this world right now that do not have a genuine faith. They have a, a rhetoric. They have a ritual. They have a religion. They have um, things that uh, they've been raised up with, but they haven't a genuine faith in Jesus Christ because the only the only thing that will stand and will not be burned up with fire will be our faith in Jesus Christ.
So, and it says much more precious than gold. Gold is a very precious metal. It's the most precious metal in the world. And it says it is tested by fire. So we will be tested by fire. Our faith will be tested. But we may be found to praise and honor and glory in the revelation of when Jesus Christ is rele- revealed in his second coming, that we will be found uh, to praise and honor and glory with him and that we will not be found lacking. Uh, and we have, it says, we have not seen, whom have not seen Christ, we love him. Though now we do not see him physically, yet believing in faith, we rejoice with inexpressible glo- of joy at the re- uh, revelation of Jesus Christ. Amen. Praise God, Barb. That's so true. Peter, you know, Peter was very shortly, this is right before his crucifixion in Rome by Nero and he was look he had the eyes to see a road to glory he was walking that path in this tumultuous time of testing and and great persecution uh, he was walking that path and looking to his savior Jesus Christ and he's telling you that uh, here that though it be tested by fire uh, we would be found to be praise and honor and glory through the revelation of Jesus Christ, whom we have not seen, even though Peter had seen and touched and handled Jesus Christ himself. He's speaking to those who have not seen Jesus, yet they believed. And we, when we are going to heaven, will have unexpress- inexpressible and full of joy, receiving the end of our faith, which is salvation of our souls. So he's saying this present time that we're in is only temporary it's but a smoke it's so short of a time that you would be spending here and then an eternal glory awaits us so he's telling you don't put all your effort all your thoughts all your 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 you know they say don't put all your eggs into one basket don't put everything on this world your hope and glory belongs in the world to come And it becomes more real in a time of great testing, a time of great persecution. This is the time when you start thinking about your eternal future, when you're being tested. You know, a lot of the great men and women of God uh, were burnt at the stake. And it must have been a horrible thing to go through to being put on a a, a cross or or a stick, tied to a post with a bunch of uh, fodder around you at the bottom. I don't know what they burn them with, uh, whether it was wood, hay, or, or, or coal, and they'd light it by f- in fire. And having that come up to you, how much, I couldn't even imagine how painful it would be to burn to death like that. But I have heard through many testimonies that they didn't feel the pain. Mm -hmm. that they were looking up when this was happening and they were very quiet. And that means that when they were burning to death, they were looking at heaven, just like Stefan when he was being stoned to death. He didn't feel the pain. He looked up and he looked at God seated up in the heavenlies and the saints were waiting for him. So it was was just fantastic. And I'm sure they probably felt the initial pain They could have felt an initial pain, but I think God superseded and interceded at that time and and then they could handle it because I couldn't imagine being burnt to death. Now, Peter was crucified upside down. He didn't feel it was, he was worthy to be crucified the same way Christ was crucified. So he uh, pleaded with them to, to, um, crucify him upside down and he was and that's a excruciatingly painful way to die too and i'm sure peter through the pain probably had the same experience and went into glory so this is this is what was on peter's mind when he's giving these scriptures that through inexpressible and full of glory receiving the end of our faith salvation of our souls now it goes on in verse 10 Of this salvation the prophets have inquired and searched carefully, who prophesied of the grace that would come to you, searching what or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ who was in them was indicating when he testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ and the glories that would follow. 
To them it was revealed that not to themselves, but to us, they were ministering these things which now have been reported to you through those who have preached the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven, things which the angels desire to look into. Now Peter here is changing and talking more about his past. He's talking about the salvation of the prophets who inquired and searched carefully, who prophesied of the grace that would come. Now, before the cross, there were Old Testament saints such as Moses and Noah and David. Think of all the wonderful saints that knew Christ. They were believing and looking forward as we look behind to the cross and what Christ did for us. They were looking forward to the message that the angels were giving them that they would receive a savior in Bethlehem. And it even said in Isaiah so beautifully about how Christ would come and be born of a virgin in Bethlehem, Ephrata, and that how he would come and then he would suffer as a lamb to the slaughter and that he would be pierced and all would see him pierced. And things that happened about Jesus Christ. Now they look toward that. So Peter is discussing the fact that the prophets inquired and searched carefully all the scriptures of what would happen, but they never saw the day. But you, the, the people here, this, the Christians he's speaking to, you're here and seeing all of this happen. You have seen this day that has come when Jesus came and when he died on a cruel cross. And when the gospel of Jesus Christ, when the apostles went out and were the first ones who went out and preached the message, and then the dispersion now of going out and preaching this message over the whole Mediterranean and beyond. So he's saying, you have been able to see this. So Peter's saying, what of what manner of time the spirit of Christ who was in them and indicated when he testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ and the glories that would follow. To them it was revealed that not, not to themselves, but to us. So he's saying not to the prophets. All of the details weren't revealed yet. They were searching the scriptures to see what would come. But it was to us that were ministering these things, which now have reported and seen all of this, and preached the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven, things which the angels desired to look into. So he, Peter is saying that humankind has a special anointing and a, and a special dispensation to see the things now which are taking place on the earth. Things that have been revealed to us through the scriptures and the spirit by the Holy Spirit that even the angels were wondering about and looking at what's gonna, what is God going to do, you know, when the time of the Acts, when the Pentecost came, the angels were looking and desiring and saying, wow, look at God's doing this and God's doing that. They were all excited and finding out the plan of salvation, uh, what God was going to be doing. Because you see, God and Jesus Christ are omnipotent. That means that they're all powerful and they're all knowledgeable. Our omnipresent means that God, Jesus Christ are the ones that are everywhere at all times. They're present at all times everywhere. Even Satan can't be omnipresent. Only Christ Jesus and God the Father. But they're omniscient because they're in power of everything. And it is just amazing through the Holy Spirit sent from heaven that we have been revealed all these beautiful secrets of the gospel. Right, Barbara? Okay. Um, it seems to me, and I've noticed that uh, as they were uh the, the early prophets like Jeremiah and Isaiah and the major and minor prophets, that they were searching diligently for the times and the, and the places when Jesus would come the first time. And uh, as I'm thinking, we are doing the same thing as they were doing, but we're searching diligently and seeking out the times and the seasons for when Christ will return the second time. It seems a, a, quite a parallel to me that we're doing the same things as they did. And as, there, as, as they were reading and searching, and expecting Christ to come the first time as uh, the suffering servant, we are uh, doing the same thing, but we're seeking the Lord to come the second time as the as to be glorified as the Lion of Judah, as he is so called, that he will be coming in his powerful, glorified state the second time. 
and that we are seeking uh, and looking diligently toward that time, just like the prophets and the, uh, did in the old time, look for the first coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Praise God. And you know, another interesting thing is that you said we are expecting to see Christ as the Lion of Judah. Amen. Praise God. Well, there was a little bit of confusion back then when Jesus Christ was on the earth because the Jewish people were all expecting to see the Lion of Judah. Uh, they were really expecting to see Christ come, destroy the Romans, and set himself up as David, the Prince of Peace, the Lion of Judah, and the King of Kings and Lord of Lords in Jerusalem and start the millennium right then and there. They were not expecting Christ to come and suffer as the Lamb of God and be crucified. They weren't expecting any of that. And even the prophets who had studied the scriptures weren't expecting any of that. But God had to uh, teach them and re-educate and kind of show them why he had to come as a, as a lamb the first time. Why he had to suffer and go through tremendous uh, pain and suffering in the crucifixion and be um, actually um, almost just, you know, when he was up on the cross, it was like he was rejected of the Father. And everyone was just in so horror and dismay that the Christ whom they loved, whom they thought was the Son of God, was being rejected by the Father. They didn't get any of that whole thing that he had to go through. But, you know, Christ did that because of the enemy. I believe he kept a lot of things secret because I really believe that if the devil knew what God was going to do in the plan of salvation as far as the death of Jesus Christ on the cross, I really believe that the devil would have tried to prevent it. And I agree with you. That's why God had to keep it a secret. And then after the fact, then God... Jesus came to his disciples and told him of why he had to suffer, why he had to do all that. And then they eventually got it. They understood the whole plan of salvation, the fact that he had to come first as the Lamb of God and then second as the Lion of Judah. So praise God. We'll go on to verse 13. Therefore, gird up your loins of your mind, be sober and rest your hope fully upon the grace that is to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, not conforming yourselves to the former lusts, as in your ignorance, but as he who called you to be holy, you also to be holy in all your conduct, because it is writ written, be holy for I am holy. Praise God. You know, Peter is just again and again telling the people here to have your hope and your confidence in the grace of Jesus Christ to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus as obedient children and not to conform yourselves to the former lusts as in your ignorance, but as he who has called you to be holy, you also be holy on, in all your conduct. For it is written, be holy for I am holy. I believe the audience of the of the people that Peter was speaking to was written to Gentiles and also to the, the dispersion of the Jews. So you will see the, the teaching where they, he is saying to not be conformed to your former lusts, which is usually spoken to Gentiles because Jewish people uh, held up the law and they were pretty righteous in their own way and their own uh, you know, because they were trying to uphold the Old Testament Jewish laws. They weren't going to be running around uh, immoral, uh, worshiping pagan idols, and all the things that the, the Gentiles were doing. And yet, with the Jewish brethren, they had come out of a lifestyle where they were very self-righteous, and they were following the pharisaical laws, and even that, Jesus disdained that. He, he, he called the Pharisees and the Sadducees vipers and snakes because of their, uh, their great hatred for him and their hypocrisy. And the things that they were doing. Because on the outside, they, he said they were caught like whited sepulchers. They'd be showing this beautiful, perfect, religious ombre on the outside. And yet inside it said they was full of dead men's bones. And, and, and they were just 
corrupt and evil on the inside. So they were they were you know depicting a religious lifestyle, but then on the inside, when no one was looking, they were into all kinds of sins and immorality and and drinking and different things that they were doing. But in the Gentiles were uh, of a lifestyle of immorality and ungodliness and worldliness. And much like a lot of people who don't know Jesus today are partying hardy and they're into all kinds of vices, we find today that the the morality of the 1950s uh, quickly faded away into the uh, hippie movement of the 60s, the Aquarian movement of the 70s. We find the uh, in the 80s it was more of a um, discotheque. <laughs> I would say, of the 80s, the 90s, the 2000s, and beyond have become a uh, disintegration of morals in this country and all over the world. We have seen a, uh, like I say, it's it's like a frog in a lukewarm pot of water. Uh, You put a frog in a in a pot and you start turning up the heat real slowly. They don't even know they're being cooked, so they don't jump out. And in a way, Lucifer has come in and he's degraded the moral fiber of this country and the world. In a, and and uh, he's taken out the, the belief system of a moral society. And I say the 1950s because, you know, in that day, I was a very little child. Uh, Barb and I were around in our first Teen, like early teens, maybe around 10, below, right before 10. And um, we had a pretty good lifestyle then. There wasn't a lot of evil that we heard of in the world. People could actually leave their doors unlocked, as you probably remember, Barb. Mm-hmm. Um, we could leave our doors unlocked and not worry about things being stolen. We didn't hear about people being raped and pillaged. and w- There was no... There was no Uh, immoral sexual behavior it was just very rare that you would hear of someone committing adultery or someone leaving their husband or their wife for somebody else Uh, extremely rare and everyone was uh, married Uh, they were they did not commit uh, sexual immorality or fornication before they got married for the most part and you, you did see nightclubs and you did see some bars but that was pretty a secret. Not many people uh, flaunted that or went around outside of the bars. It, it just wasn't something you would see on a daily basis. There were, the policemen were on the streets and, and you could wave hi to people and, and talk to them and be pretty safe walking around at night. In fact, the police would be walking around the streets uh, with their flashlights and and everybody be waving to each other outside the door and and you'd have people that could chaperone you uh, walking around and people would help you if in fact if you were a young child and you were in a amusement park there would be a place where it would be called lost children and if you got separated from your mom or dad there was no fear that someone would abduct you or take you uh, it was a given that someone would find you and take you to that lost uh, children place and the parents would be reunited you know we never thought of the things that are happening today just weren't even on our minds can you expand on that a little Barb? yes it says uh, therefore gird up the loins of your mind be sober and it says as obedient children not conforming yourselves to the former lust as in your ignorance the lord calls it ignorance that, uh, you know, we were part of that too. It's not like we grew up completely pious and completely innocent, um, Val. You and me, we were caught up in a few things of the world too. But the Lord saved us in our teens, and he put those seeds of obedience in our hearts. Yes, and he we did. knew yes. what we were doing was wrong, and we knew right from wrong, and we uh, wanted to please the Lord. We wanted to obey him. So even though we uh, had had a few years that we might have uh, struggled and and tumbled along as it says in your ignorance that we uh, turned from the world and we turned from um, the the uh, 
the lust of the eyes and the flesh and the pride of life as it describes in the scripture and we pull and we turned our hearts completely to Jesus and we sure it wasn't the easiest road we we had difficulties and there was persecution along the way and uh, ups and downs in the Christian walk but I'd rather have lived uh, you know the years that we've lived for Christ and sacrificed and learned from him, i rather have lived that way, even though we did walk through some uh, valleys of the shadow of death, that, um, as it describes in Psalms so beautifully, that we, we did always turn back to Christ. We did always walk with Christ. We did always desire to grow in him. And here we are. Uh, have we been saved 45 years now? Um, here we are with Christ and walking strong with him and blessed and I wouldn't trade that for anything in the world it says in the um, in Revelation that we overcome the evil one by the word of our testimony and by the blood of Christ this is the word of our testimony is our walk with Christ and what we have done for him and what he has done for us and I would not trade uh, any of that for the for the riches and for the um, you know pride and for the glory uh, for the uh, fleeting um, um, enjoyment of, of the world for a moment. Amen. Praise God. Now in verse 16 it says, Be holy for I am holy. Now you were discussing that briefly that we did turn to Christ in our teens. I did. I, I accepted Jesus Christ in 1971. You know, um, but I was speaking before that when we were very little it seemed so wonderful out in society and the morals were pretty good at that time but right in the 60s the hippie movement the drugs came in uh, people were starting to change it, that atmosphere was starting to change uh, to a more sinful was more accepted uh, marijuana came in and everyone was smoking marijuana and things started becoming a little more acceptable of being more uh, rowdy and it, it happened around our teen times. So when we were in our teens, this rebellion started in the 60s and 70s, and we fell right into it in the, fir in the beginning. Uh, we both uh, sowed our little wild oats, as they call it, as everybody usually does in their teens. Uh, I find it very rare when a teenager uh, has not done that. Uh, but there are a few out there that have lived a blessed life. Bless God, man! I would have, I would have loved to have lived a blessed life in that case and not done some of the stupid things that I did <laughs> as a teenager. But I learned, boy, I'll tell you, with a little red butt <laughs> from the Lord. You know, I call it spanking. You know, the Lord chastises those, you know, and brings them back out into the right conduct, as as Peter says here, in all your conduct, be holy for I am holy and we we got it you know and turned our little way back to God and and mm -hmm. both of us I think it's wonderful and I don't regret that for a minute in God's mercy he brought us out of the sins of our past in the ignorance and the lust and he brought us into a holy conduct uh, for he is holy and we should be holy and then uh, in verse 17 it goes on and if you call on the Father, who without partiality judges according to each one's own work, conduct yourselves throughout the time of your stay here in, here in fear, knowing that you were not redeemed with corruptible things like silver or gold from your aimless conduct received by tradition of your fathers, but with the precious blood of Jesus Christ as the lamb without blemish and without spot. He indeed was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you, who through him, him believe in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory, so that your faith and hope are in God. Well, praise God. Here Peter's saying that the conduct of ourselves through the time of your stay here in fear. Now this fear he's speaking about is not the kind of fear that you're in terror. This is a reverent fear of God. You, we have, there's a certain type of fear of the Lord. Now, that doesn't mean you're supposed to be terrified in, in a spirit of fear. This means that you have reverence and you have a godly fear, a reverential fear of the Lord where you are really not sure that next time you get tempted and you see the devil wants you to go out and do something really wrong, you're going to think about it. 
And you're going to go, well, wait a minute. I don't like the repercussions from God the Father. I don't like the repercussions of that sin. I don't like the consequences that I'll have to face if I do that sin. I'm going to do it right because I fear the Lord and I want to obey him. So that's what he's talking about there. Saying that he was, we were not, not redeemed by corruptible things like silver and gold from your aimless conduct received by traditions of your fathers. Now he's talking about the tradition of the elders in the Jewish faith, that they held on to the uh, corruptible things like silver and gold. And, and also the uh, Gentiles were uh, definitely doing this, that they held silver and gold to be so uh, something that they want to attain, and they put all their energy into gathering silver and gold. And it even says that you've, you've collected silver and gold up until the last days. And certainly we've heard another adage say you can't take it with you. So when you die, you can't take your silver and gold with you. So everything that the world offers to be gathering up these corruptible things and, and you put all your effort and time and, and energy into gathering these, these uh, riches for yourself, Peter is saying we must put the priority right but that the precious blood of Jesus Christ as a lamb without blemish and without spot is what we should gain hold of. It is the most precious thing beyond silver and gold. And we have been redeemed by this precious blood of the lamb who indeed was foreordained before the foundation of the world and was manifest in these last times for you. Now, Peter is saying here that he believes he was in the last times. And we believe correctly so that the last time started when Jesus died on the cross. After his death, that began the, the last times. And we've been going through these last times for 2,000 years. And he said that God here in verse 20 was foreordained before the foundation of the world. What that means is that Christ is the Alpha, the Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last, as it says in Revelations. It means that Jesus Christ was with God when the world was created. He was there before the foundation of the world. He's there past, present, and future being God, one in Christ, in, in the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, all one in Jesus Christ. That he becomes that foreordained, which means it was all foreordained before the foundation of the world that Jesus would come, die a cruel death on the cross, salvation for our souls, and then in the end times that we're living in now, he would come back as a second time as the Lion of Judah to reveal himself to the world and to punish the world for the wickedness of the sins and to bring all those in the rapture that are righteous in Christ Jesus and that we would be with Christ during the marriage supper of the Lamb in heaven for the seven years during the tribulation when the people are down here on the world who didn't believe in Christ and also those who thought they knew Christ but didn't live for Christ. That's so important. Are you living for Christ? As it says in Matthew chapter 7, which we discussed in great detail about those who thought they knew God, who, who did the works of God, who did many mighty works in his name, but Christ came and said, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work wickedness. So they said they were Christian. Oh, I was born into the Christian faith, so I guess I'm a Christian. But then they went out and lived a worldly life and never served God, never knew him as a person, their personal savior, never got rid of their pet sins. These are the people that are going to be left behind. And then they're going to have to go through the seven-year tribulation, which will be horrible. But even so, during that time, Jesus is going to give those people another chance, although they're going to be beheaded. It says the Antichrist will behead the Christians in that seven-year tribulation. And it will be a horrible time because they won't be able to buy or sell. 
They won't be able to buy food. They won't be able to do anything because if you're a Christian during that tribulation hour, you cannot take the mark of the beast. Because if you take that mark in your right hand or your forehead, it says in Revelations that you will be damned forever in hell fire. That's very clear in scripture. You do not take the mark. And, and Antichrist will come and force all those people who did not take the mark to be beheaded. But they will come out of the tribulation, as it says in Revelations, and God will save them. But it's going to be horrible to go through that. I would never want to go through the tribulation. I definitely want to be the bride of Christ who comes and, and is raptured out. Right, Barbara? Mm-hmm. That's absolutely true. Um, I love what it keeps referring to and Peter keeps saying in these last times for you, in these last times for you, to be revealed in the last times for you. He's such an individual God. He uh, speaks to you personally in the scripture. It says uh, in verse 17, and, and if you call on the Father, and that's the condition, if you call on the Father being the condition, who without partiality judges according to each one's work. That's individual. That's your works. He's going to judge you according to your own works, not the works of another. And he says in the scripture that this is all in the all done for you and that we are definitely living in the last times. And we need to be sober, as the scripture says, uh, checking our our hearts every day, uh, making sure that we are uh, obeying God and we are walking right with God and also the stress of also um, evangelizing and preaching to others and sharing others your faith and uh, because it's God's will that all be saved and none would enter into eternal uh, damnation um, amen it's true God praise God mm -hmm. praise God well we go on in the ending of the first chapter here since you, in verse 22, since you have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the spirit and sincere love of the brethren, love one another fervently with a pure heart, having been born again, not of corruptible seed, but incorruptible through the word of God, which lives and abides forever because all flesh is grass and all the glory of man is the flower of the grass. The grass withers and it flower fades away but the word of the lord endures forever now this is the word which the gospel was preached to you praise god so peter again is summing up the chapter in a beautiful way talking about agape love the sincere love of the brethren the love of one another fervently with a pure heart and there we go again with the holiness the pure heart be holy for i am holy we have a pure heart being born again not of incorruptible of corruptible seed but incorruptible through the word of god which abides and lives in us forever so this incorruptibility is a very important component which Paul is speaking about versus what is corruptible because he, is, he has spoken of in this chapter of, pre, of, of gold and silver which is only corruptible and the things of this world which uh, rust and, and the moth eats and they're no good. They fade away into nothingness. Uh, the things of the world are almost like cotton candy. If you've ever eaten cotton candy, they spin it with this, this cotton-like substance. And when you put it in your mouth, it looks really big. Uh, when you, I don't know if, you know, some people may not know what cotton candy is. They, they, when they take the spun sugar, and it's really huge. It looks like a gigantic, uh, big gigantic ball on a cone that you eat, and you put it in your mouth and it just dissipates to nothing. It's just this tiny little mm -hmm. speck of sugar in your mouth when you eat it. So um, this is like the things of the world. This is a picture of what they are like. They look so beautiful on the outside. They're all puffed up and shiny and everything. And you're, you're just thinking about it all the time in your eyes. You lust after it because it looks so wonderful and enticing to you. This is what Lucifer does. But then when you go into it and get it, it's almost just like after you've eaten it, it just dissipates to nothing. 
What is it worth when you're old and you've had all these things, but you don't know Jesus Christ? You don't have not done anything to help your brothers and sisters. You've done nothing to help mankind to do anything good in life, but it just amass these things for yourself. I've heard it also said that the one with the most toys when he dies wins. Well, that's really a fallacy because in the world it's true. This is the worldly uh, morals, which I call anti-morals. This is not what you should be seeking in your life. This is not man's highest good. Man's highest good is to help his fellow brothers and sisters to do good things for mankind and to know Jesus Christ as their personal Savior and then go on to eternity with God in Jesus Christ when they die. What a beautiful legacy you have of all the people you've witnessed to and all the people that come into the kingdom and escape eternal life in hell eternally because you preached the word of God to them and they accepted Jesus Christ and they escaped that. That is the best legacy you could possibly have as a human being here on earth. So there's a there's a definite uh, beautiful depiction here that Peter's speaking of, of those who have come out of the world, of those who have left their taste for uh, striving after gold and silver and the things of the world, and then coming into the precious blood of Jesus Christ, finding it far more profitable to have a life in Christ Jesus, suffering even for a short time, to walk into that eternal life and be totally set free and go into that eternal life with Jesus Christ, loving the brethren. And that's how you love the brethren. It's, it's just a beautiful, beautiful chapter. So we've now done a study of 1 Peter chapter 1. Next uh, Wednesday, we're going to start with chapter 2. So, Barbie, you have any last words to say? Yes, um, in verse 22, since you have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the Spirit, it's the Spirit that uh, does all this through you. When you yield yourself to Christ, it's the Spirit that helps you to do these things, and you have the desire to do it. You give the Spirit permission to do this through you, and it's through Christ's strength that we will accomplish all these things. It's through the strength of the Holy Spirit that we will be able to have purified souls and we will be able to obey the truth. And God promises that he will do this through us. So we just continue every day to make ourselves obey, obey this, the word of God and to read the word of God, to learn what God's truth is, and then to b obey it, to, to surrender our, our wants and our desires and our, and our uh, rebellions, to, uh, to sacrifice that and to, to crucify it uh, of the flesh, and so that we can obey the truth, and the Spirit will uh, give us the strength to do it. If we sincerely love God, and sincerely love our fellow uh, brethren in a what I like to say as unconditionally, an unconditional love with a pure heart. And that's how we're going to enter into heaven, with unconditional love and pure hearts. And the Spirit of God is going to carry us there. And we just continue to keep ourselves every day uh, uh, surrendered to Christ and doing His work. And we will have such a beautiful, accumulated at the end of our time, such a beautiful testimony. And I just praise God for my testimony, and I praise God for my sister and her testimony. And I praise God and, and look forward to our uh, future, our, our eternity in, in glory with Christ. And it all came through the power of the Holy Spirit and not by my own strength. Praise God. Amen. Well, God bless you today. I'm glad you were here to listen to our word today. I pray you'll continue to listen to our teaching. And Peter is a wonderful epistle. So God bless you and have a wonderful day. Welcome to Luke 418 Church Women's Conference. This will be a wonderful time of breakthrough for women to come and get spiritually fed. Do you sometimes feel that you just can't control your thoughts? Do you feel hounded by bad memories of the past that still feel alive today? 
Are you hurting on the inside? If so, Luke 418 Church Women's Conference can help free you from the pursuit of that mental and spiritual anguish. Free yourself from the past and free yourself from the hurt you feel inside. If you are experiencing repeated feelings of anger, hatred, lack of self-control, anxiety, or confusion, come to Luke 418 Church Women's Conference who can restore you and set you on a road to recovery. The lineup of speakers along with Pastor Bill French, who's hosting this event, are Reverend Colette Boudouin of International Restoration Ministries, Sherry Wakeman of Luke 418 Church Radio, talk show host, Reverend Marie Burbe, who is a professional counselor, and I will be there, Reverend Valerie French, and my sister, Minister Barbara Lee, we are the Righteous Twins. Come for your healing breakthrough and become spiritually fed. The conference will be held on September 8th, a Saturday, 2018, from 10 a.m. to 9 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. And the location will be 444 Indian Wells Lane in Indian Wells, California. And that will be at the Renaissance Indian Wells Resort and Spa. Please come, bring your friends. This will be a wonderful time of restoration and healing for every woman who needs help. Amen.
Luke 418 Radio has been commissioned in these last days to preach Jesus Christ, the Son of God, who is the only name written under heaven by which men might be saved. Our mission is to teach and train up the body of Christ in the Great Commission to share the gospel of Jesus Christ, to cast out evil spirits, pray over the sick that they may be healed. For the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because He has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and recovery of sight to the blind. If this program is a blessing to you and you would like to take part in this end time harvest of souls, join us by donating online. Go to www.luke418radio.com. God bless you.